Hey guys, Brad Phillips here with Puppy Steps Training. I have Ruthie in the crate with me. Uh, I will pull her out in just a minute. Uh, before doing that, before we get into really the meat of the demonstration, I want to talk just specifically about Ruthie, and then I also want to you know, touch on some of the, the more basic aspects of training. So first thing, Ruthie is super sweet. She is just going to make a great family dog. She loves affection and attention, loves to play, and is just a sweetheart. So I think you guys are going to really enjoy her. Uh, the one thing that I, I want to talk about a little bit more in detail is that excited peeing that she's got going on. Now it has lessened a ton. I'm hoping that that means that she is going to grow out of it. But you never know. Not all dogs do. And it might be something that, that you deal with throughout her life. Now if you properly manage it, it won't be that big of a deal. But if you, if you don't, then she'll do it all the time. And that's what we were dealing with first thing when we first got her. She would get so excited that even if I looked at her, she'd be like, oh my gosh, he's, he's paying attention to me, and she would pee. And so she just gets super excited. So now we've just kind of given her kind of proper outlets for that energy and made sure that we do it in an appropriate manner where it's not going to matter if she does pee a little bit. So if Ruthie is going to be super excited, it's outside. I try not to wind her up in the house. Uh, if we're going to wrestle and play and I'm going to give her a, a ton of uh, physical attention, then it's going to be outside. If I know that she needs to go to the bathroom, so like first thing in the morning or she hasn't been out in a couple hours, I'm going to basically ignore her until we go out and go to the bathroom. So that way I'm not greeting her, I'm not giving her any attention inside, and I'm not giving her an opportunity to excitedly pee. Now once I know that she's gone to the bathroom, then I'll greet her in the house and I'll pet her and, and she can still be part of the family and she's receiving affection. But if I know that bladder is full, I'm taking her to the bathroom first. Now in the house or any time that you are greeting her, the big thing that's going to be super important is this greeting. So if I call her over, she has to be sitting before I give her any attention. So that's going to help out with that. And then a lot of times I'll just put my hand down first, just that way I'm standing straight up. I'm not going to lean over her at all because by leaning over a dog, you're kind of putting yourself in this kind of dominant uh, position. So instead I'll just put my hand down, I'll scratch her on the ear, make sure that she knows that she's doing the right thing, but I'm not going to get like in her face or get her wound up or, or get her too excited. Now once she shows that she's sitting, she's in control, then I'll bend down to pet her, or I'll crouch down to pet her. Once again, I'm not going to bend over her, but instead I'll kind of turn sideways and then I'll crouch down. And then I'll allow her to, to kind of scoot into me. So that way, once again, I'm not, I'm not like giving her, you know, this super overwhelming, here I am in your face, get excited. Instead I'm going to be to my side, which is less dominant. And then I'm going to pet her a lot on her sides, her chest, and kind of around her ears. Uh, what I don't want to do is lean over her and pet her straight down. Because uh, that's going to, I mean, your body language is just telling her that she needs to excitedly pee. It's just kind of overwhelming, if that makes sense. Sorry, words are kind of hard today for me. Uh, but if you can just make sure that she's sitting, kind of move off to the side so you're less dominant, less aggressive then she's going to uh, submissively pee or excitedly pee a lot less. So hopefully that made sense. But she has been doing great. Uh, we really haven't had too big, too big of an issue with it lately as we've just been really strict on this. And once again, not allowing her to get overly excited in the house. <clears throat> uh, the other thing to remember is Ruthie is still a puppy. So because of that, there's going to be a lot of growing, a lot of maturing. And she needs to understand that you have the same expectations I do. And that's the purpose of doing this video is so that you can see the way that I interact with her. And you can basically replicate it uh, in your own home. So also understand that she is going to make mistakes. You're not buying a stuffed animal. It's a, a living, breathing puppy. And so once again, she's going to make mistakes. And so I'll talk a lot like worst case scenario or what to do if these things happen. And that's for you to understand, you know, if she does make a mistake, this is how I handle it. This is so that I can build her up instead of tear her down. With the training, we always train to success, not to failure. So now 
the two biggest things that I can emphasize here, and, and really the kind of their keys to success, or the two secrets of dog training, if you will, um, that's consistency and management. If you can consistently reward and correct her, especially during this transition phase, she is going to quickly understand that you have the same expectations that I do, and that's going to help her, you know, kind of fit into your family. She's going to build a better relationship with you because it's not that different. Um, the only difference is the environment, really. So when we reward her, so she does know the word okay, she knows that when she hears that word, some type of reward is coming. So she is still a puppy, so she's growing, and she's very food motivated. So that is just your, your biggest means of motivation there. So I use food very heavily in these early stages. But if you don't have food on you, you can use praise and affection and toys. All three of those are great means to a reward. So if you don't have that food and she does something great, just go down and, and pet her and, and praise her and that, that'll be perfect. Now on the other side of things, you do have to correct your dog. We are a balanced dog training system. So in order for your dog to truly understand what you are asking them, you do need to correct them when they do something uh, bad or an incorrect behavior. So I don't believe that you ever need to actually physically dominate your dog. Instead, dogs read our emotion, our body language, and our voice fluctuation. So by adjusting those, you are going to give her a good enough correction. Especially, so if I'm training her, just to give you an example, and she does something simple, like she breaks a stay, all I'm going to do is kind of step into her and I'll say no, and then I'll have her do it again. Now it's important that you have her do it again because I always want to end on a correct behavior. Even if, like in this case, doing stays, if I have to shorten that way down, I want to make sure that she gets these positive repetition. Uh, now on the other side of things, if she does something a little bit more severe, like she jumped up on me, or tried to steal food, or jumped up on the table, anything that's that she's absolutely not supposed to do, I'm not going to, like I said, I'm not going to physically dominate my dog, I'm not going to hit her, but instead if I just, Ruthie, no! You know, kind of raise your voice, get a little deeper, I puff out my chest. By adjusting that inflection in your voice and your body language, that gives her a quick, firm correction and she knows that she did something wrong. The only type of physical correction we use is a leash correction. And this can be used if she's jumping or pulling or anything like that. And what it is, is just two quick pops. So it's not a yank her back, it's a pop pop and then I'll give her instruction. So what I'm, I'm hoping for is that I can regain her attention to then change her behavior. So uh, that, that's the consistency. Now the management aspect. Management is super simple. It just breaks down to maintaining control. If you can maintain control of your dog, she's not going to have an opportunity to have a destructive behavior or create you know, destructive habits. She's also not going to have an opportunity to pee in the house because you are watching her. And so if you can maintain control, you stop these negative behaviors from ever becoming an issue. House training is a perfect example of that. If you take her home and you think that she is going to be perfect and you give her free access to your house, you are in for some trouble. That, that's not going to work. Instead, for the first little while, you need to give her 100% supervision. So that way she can't sneak around the corner and have an accident because you're kind of hovering over her. And good management is if I can't give her that supervision, I put her in a crate. You can see that she's very comfortable in the crate and that's going to be your biggest asset in managing her house training. And I will I'll touch on management throughout the entire program because it is so intertwined with everything that we do. So now I just want to briefly talk about this transition period. I'll talk about it throughout the program, but really what this is is the next two to four weeks. So Ruthie is going to be transitioning to your home. Uh, she needs to build a relationship with you, and that relationship needs to be built on you being a leader. Uh, and so that's where this consistency in management is going to really play a huge part in. Also understanding the effects of this transition. So she is going to be under a lot of stress. This stress will manifest itself in needing to go to the bathroom more frequently or having a loose stool, maybe feeling a little bit anxious or depressed, losing an appetite. These are some of the things that you're going to see. And so it's important that these first couple days you really do just focus on building a relationship with her, bonding with her, and just helping her under... Sorry, excuse me. Uh, helping her feel trust in you and feel secure in your relationship. 
So don't push her too hard on the commands right off. Expect the manners that I'm going to show you, but then just really focus on bonding with her and just helping her feel comfortable. So with that, uh, we are going to pull her out and start working on some of these manners. Uh, but I guess one more thing before I do that is just to touch on this socialization phase that we do. And this was the first two weeks that we did with her. Uh, basically what socialization is, is just a lot of exposure to uncomfortable sounds, textures, people, places, all that. So when we do that, I work on a lot of engagement. So when I find something that's really kind of stressing them out, uh, if it's something that's not as frequent or something that happens on a walk or anything like that, that's when I'll engage with her. What I'll do is I'll have her sit at my feet and I'll just, okay, good girl, okay, and I'll, I'll help her feel confident. I'll get her excited and see that this positive interaction is coming from me and not from the distraction or whatever's around. Now, if it's something that is constant, something that's always going on in your house, like say even a hair dryer, at that point, I just want to leave that on and have her just get completely used to it. I'm not gonna coddle that, that experience. I just want her to get used to the sound or the object or whatever it is. So, but engagement is a really powerful tool, especially on walks and when, you know, certain things come out that can overstimulate your dog. So, with that, now I'm going to pull Ruthie out. The first manner that you are going to see is her gates and her doorways. So, anytime she comes out of a crate, she comes through a house door, uh, any type of closed door or gate, I expect her to stay. This should be an automatic behavior. I'm not going to tell her to stay, so then I just expect her to do it. Now, if she did break, I might simply close that door, maybe lift up my leg and block her. If I had stepped back, then I would actually tell her no. But once again, I'm never going to tell her to stay. Okay, good girl. Now, in your home, the first couple times going through doorways, you're going to need to make sure that she understands that that's your expectation for that door. And so I would have a leash on her, and if we walk up and I open that door and she tries to walk out, I would just pop her twice and then wait for her to put that attention on you and then say, okay, and proceed out. So, and uh, now her greeting is what she's doing here. I'm not sure if she's in that frame or not. But if I invite her over, come here, Ruthie. Once again, I'm going to wait till she is sitting, and then I'm going to kind of go really low key so that I'm not, I'm not overwhelming her. And which right now she's trying to guess what I want her to do. Good girl. And then once she's sitting, then I'll go ahead and give her that attention. Good girl. Good girl. And then I can pet her. Good girl. So expect that greeting anytime you invite her over, uh, anytime she greets a new person, I expect her to sit. So this is super important for, once again, that excited urination. It's also a replacement behavior for jumping. Okay, outside, which she probably doesn't need to go to the bathroom. We have it in the crate a minute. So I'm going to hook a leash on her and we're gonna run her outside. Okay, go girl. So we will talk about her house training in detail in just a little bit. But you'll notice there when we walked outside, I didn't expect her to sit. I just wanted her to show that she was in control and wasn't going to run through that doorway. <clears throat> so then, uh, going back to this greeting, so expect that behavior. Good girl. Uh, you'll also notice when you get this greeting, uh, when her hind end goes down, her eyes come up, and so once I have eye contact with her, I know that she's focused on me, and then I can give her further instruction. So now her mealtime manners. Anytime I feed Ruthie, I expect her to hold a sit stay. Now where she's already sitting, I can just uh, set this down here. Okay, good girl, good girl. So you'll notice she's looking to me for permission. Um, I am the leader, uh, so I do control the food, when she eats, what she can eat. So that is uh, building that respect with her. She's also really funny when she eats. 
She does like to lay down and just kind of take her time. But she is very comfortable with me sticking my hands in her food bowl. She's not going to show any type of aggression or anything like that. And I can take it away. Oh, good girl, huh? You'll also notice when I fed her, I didn't actually ask her to stay. That is also another automatic behavior. <clears throat> so, along with handling her when she eats or handling her food, I want to make sure that there's no aggression whatsoever. And so that even counts for, like, handling her. Uh, so her ears, she's very comfortable with. Her paws. We did take her to the groomer yesterday, and they said she was just awesome. She did so good. So she's not aggressive over being handled. Her mouth. Really great, huh? So, yeah. Good, good that way. She's also very comfortable, <clears throat> comfortable with me handling her with her toys or chews or anything like that. And which toys are really important for a dog. And so toy drive, of course, is important, but also toys can create a barrier to prevent um, basically playful behaviors that can be mistaken as aggression. So especially with kids, kids are the greatest thing to a dog. They play, they run, they squeal. It's just like a, a giant squeaky toy is all. And so Ruthie will want to play along. So I make a rule that any time kids play with my dog, they have to have a toy. Uh, the toy, like I said, creates a barrier. Instead of grabbing, going for a pant leg or an arm or knocking a kid over, she is going to go for this toy. And if you do have a child that's maybe a little bit nervous of a dog, they can throw the toy and direct her away. Good girl. Drop it. Good girl. Now, if I'm playing with her, uh, when I ask her to drop it, I take the toy and I throw it. So the toy's a reward in that case. Oh, good girl. But I can, I can tug with her a little bit. But she does know that if I ask her to drop it, she has to release it. Good girl. Good girl. She can't yank it out of my hand or try and run the other direction or anything like that. Drop it. Good girl. Good girl. Now, if I'm going to take it away for a while, then I would replace it. And so if I asked her to drop it, I would then give her a treat. But if I am playing with her with a toy, I'm not going to pull out any food. Because as soon as you do that, she loses interest in the toy. Now, also, something a little bit more higher value, a bully stick. She does love them. Uh, she should be very comfortable with me handling it. She shouldn't ever try and take it and run or get aggressive or anything like that. So I can reach in here and hold it. She's not going to try and bite my fingers or try and wrestle it away from me. Drop it. Good girl. So you'll notice that she hesitated just a little bit, and I just held it really still, and then she she opened her mouth and just let it go. Now if she didn't, and she just kept, you know, chomping down on it and wasn't gonna let it go, then I would just simply reach my hand around the top of her muzzle and curl her lips under her teeth, and she'll just bleh, spit it right out. So we're gonna try right here. I'm gonna say. Ruthie, drop it. Good girl. And she should drop it on the ground and look up at me. Hmm? Oh. Good girl. So once again, should be very comfortable with me handling her and her her objects. Good girl. Good girl. Now you'll also notice when I gave this to her, I didn't allow her to lunge up and grab it. If all four paws are not on the ground, then I'm not going to give it to her. And if she kept trying to rear up, then I would actually tell her gently. And so I can also tell her this taking treats. And when I do this, I want to make sure that, once again, she's very cautious and that I don't fill her teeth at all. So that's why, in general, I always give the treat in the palm of my hand. And I use my thumb here to, to cover it up. And she should use her lips and her tongue to take that treat. I should never fill her teeth. But if she did try and like reach out and grab it, I'd pull that back and tell her gently. Now, if you give her a treat between your thumb and forefinger, you're asking her to bite your fingers. 
but my kids are terrible at this. They always do it this way, so I do practice, and she should still be very cautious, um, and I don't want her to, to clamp down. Now, with this way, oh, eat the crumbs. Oh, there you go. You are going to feel some teeth because your fingers are covering the treat, but she should not clamp down on your fingers. Gently. Gently. Good girl. Good girl. Good girl. So just like that. Um, okay. Making sure I cover everything here. So our next two manners are kind of the two bigger ones, and management is critical. So the first one is chewing. So once again, Ruthie is still a puppy. Uh, she has two of her canines that her adult teeth are coming down next to, and so those are going to come out like any day now. And then she's also cutting molars. So chewing has to happen. You just can't escape it. It's just part of owning a dog. Now she's going to be doing it more right now where she's teething, but then she's also going to need to chew like throughout her life. And so in order to prevent like destructive chewing or things getting destroyed, there's two ways to manage it. First is avoiding. Uh, obviously, if you can keep things away from her, things picked up that you don't want chewed up, that's going to be the best way to avoid them getting chewed up. However, it's never possible in your home. There's always something that she's going to have access to. And so that's why, especially during this transition, you need to be really consistent with replacing. So if I saw her go up and she started chewing on a soft bed or a pillow, um, I would tell her no, and then I would replace it with something of the same consistency or texture. So something soft, I'd give her a soft toy. She wanted to chew on a table leg or something hard, I'd give her something like this bully stick. Wants to chew on her leash or shoelaces, give her a rope. But if you can match that texture consistency, you're matching her needs. Because she's chewing on certain things just based on what she feels like her mouth needs. If she needs something soft that'll just pull a tooth out, maybe catch and pull a tooth out, or something hard to loosen it, that's what she's going to be chewing on. So, replacement. Tell her no, give her something she's allowed to chew on. Uh, the other cause of chewing is boredom. Uh, boredom is really the cause of all destructive behaviors. So if I know that she's going to have a downtime, I just give her something to do. So say we're watching a movie or reading a book, I'll just give her something to chew on and she'll take it to her bed and just hang out. Now, if I give her something to chew on and she gets up and leaves it, then I'm going to take it away. So that way she does not have free access to her own things. If she does have free access to her own toys and shoes, she's going to get bored with them and she's going to go and chew on something else. So you're creating basically a novelty effect. That way it's still exciting. Uh, the other cause of destructive behaviors is lack of exercise. So it is important that you let her run, let her burn off uh, this excess energy, and that will save you from destructive chewing or digging or anything like that. Um, the other thing that goes along with chewing is mouthing. We really haven't had an issue with mouthing with Ruthie. She's really good. Uh, so I can pet her and she won't grab my sleeves or my watch or anything like that. If she did, I would quickly tell her no and I would grab her muzzle, hold it still for a second, and then withdraw myself. Uh, if she puts her teeth on me, she is not allowed to have my attention or my affection. I'll wait a little bit and then I can go back to petting her. Same thing if she comes up and starts chewing on my pants or my shoelaces, anything like that, I would quickly tell her no, grab her muzzle, hold it for a second, and then move away from her or remove her. So, um, The last manner is jumping. So jumping is a huge behavior in puppies. Ruthie was um, just like any other puppy, loved to jump, loved to see us. Now you'll notice that she's kind of hopped up here in front of me a little bit. Now, I'm all right with that, uh, but she knows that she is not allowed to put her paws up on me. She's not allowed to get up onto the couch or the counter or anything like that. Now, you need to really, once again, manage this behavior because as soon as she thinks that she can get away with it, she'll continue to try. So, the command here is off, and that's whether she jumps up on a person or an object, and I expect her to immediately get down and all four paws should be on the ground. If she doesn't, I remove her. 
So say you're sitting on the couch, you call her over, or maybe she even just comes over and she puts two front her two front paws up on the couch and is like, hey, I'm going to hop up here. And you tell her off, she better remove those paws. If she doesn't, I will go and push those paws down. Then I will ignore her for a second, make sure that she's being polite and waiting for me to give her attention, and then I'll go and pet her a little bit. Now, if I have a hold of the leash, say I'm on a walk, and she goes and tries to jump up on somebody, that's when I will pop her twice, and I will say, no, off, and I expect her to get down. Now, if you don't have control of her, you don't have control of that, le that leash, and say she's running around outside, and she comes running up to you, and you think, oh, she might jump on me, it is so important that you never step backwards. As soon as you step back, you turn it into a game, and she's going to try to jump even harder. So instead, if she was running at me, I would step into her. That way I'm restricting the space. I'm showing, hey, I'm in charge. This is not okay. And then if she did try and jump, I would bring my knee up into her chest. This does scare a lot of people, but the objective there is to put the dog onto their back. By putting her into, into that position or onto her back, uh, she is in a position where she's basically um, showing submission. And so if I do that, usually I only have to do it once and then they won't jump on me again. But also I, I try and be aware if you are on concrete or somewhere where she could really get hurt, I'm not going to you know, bring my knee up. I'll just kind of block her a little bit. Uh, but if I'm on the grass or in the house on the carpet, I'm going to put her right onto her back and uh, accompany that with no off. But she has done really well with not putting her paws on me. Sometimes she just gets excited and bounds out here. So. Um, with that, I believe that's all of our manners. If you do have any questions with them, please don't hesitate. You know, sh give me a call, shoot me a text, email, whatever. But I'm going to make sure that those make sense. So watch me is a super simple command. All I'm looking for is her to make eye contact with me. And you can see that she has great focus anyway. She will just sit here and stare at me. And sometimes it's hard to distract her. Um, so I'm going to put this food right out here. Watch me. Okay, good girl. And so as soon as she breaks focus from the tree and makes eye contact with me, I will mark that behavior. So like I said, it's super simple. I try and practice it a variety of different ways. Watch me. Okay, good girl. And so there she was staring more at my hand in the tree bag, and so I'm going to wait until she puts her eyes up here, and then I will mark that behavior. Now I use her name very similarly that if I say her name, I want her to make eye contact with me. The only difference is I'm not going to give her a treat every single time I say her name. Whereas that watch me command, I try and use a high value reward every time so that I know that she will just stop and give me her focus. Where her name you're going to say it all the time and it's probably not going to have the same um, connection there. She'll still look at you, but she doesn't expect a high value reward every single time you say her name. Ruthie. Okay, good girl. Good girl. So, I will also use her name every single time that I call her to come. Because this recall command is sometimes more of an advanced command, I want to have kind of odds stacked in my favor. So if I can get her focus, if I can get her eye contact, and then call her to come, I have a better chance of her coming every time when called. So. This, this come command, like I said, it's an advanced command. It is one that you see burned out quite a bit, just in the dog community. Uh, you'll see people screaming at their dog to come, and their dog's like, yeah, no way, I'm going that way, and they'll run away from them. And so I have a couple rules that I live by uh, to protect this recall command so that it is in place when I desperately need it. So my first rule is I never use the come command in the house because I don't need to. I have control. Even if she tried to sneak away, it's not like she can you know, open the door and go four blocks down. It's that she might run into the kitchen and then I just go and get her. You know? So instead, if I want her to come over to me and I'm in the house, all I have to do is just be like, Ruthie, come here! And she's going to get up and come over to me. Well, that's a good girl. That's a good girl. So getting animated, high pitch, sometimes I'll even snap. Oh, good girl something like that. Those are very simple ways to get her focus and her attention and have her come to me in the house. Now, my other rule is don't overuse it. So if you are outside, or this goes along even in the house, uh, 
don't just sit there and call her to come to get her out of the way or because she's getting in trouble. Because uh, if you if you just use it in those manners, when you really need the come command, she's going to look at you like, what, I don't get anything out of it. And she's going to go back to doing whatever she found fun in the first place. So I... Uh, that's why I practice it a lot, and there's kind of a fine line there between overusing it and practice. So when I practice it, I'll use it a lot, but I have the means to follow through and to reward. So when I start this exercise or start working on recall commands, I put her on a long lead, so a 20 or 30 foot leash, and I just let her go and be a dog. She can run around, sniff, roll, play, whatever. Um, but when I when I do that, every minute or two, I will call her to come just to give her a treat and let her go again. And I try and keep that really positive heavy. So nine times out of 10, I'm calling her to me, I'm giving her a treat and letting her go again. Okay. For that one time, that, that one out of 10 where I end the fun. So we leave the park, we end the hike, we go on a crate, anything like that. So keep it really positive heavy. Once she's responding to you and she's coming every time on leash, then I take her somewhere where I still have some control, so like a fenced in area with limited distractions, and I let her off leash. And I do the same thing. We're just gonna go for a walk or go and play, but every minute or two, I'm gonna call her to me just to give her a treat and let her go again. If she hesitates, she goes back on the long lead. If she doesn't, if she's just returning every time, then I might add a few more distractions. And I'm just gonna progressively work on this. My dogs are now six and three, and I still work on recall commands. It's a, a process that never ends. You should always be working with your dog. The other thing is if you do call her to you, um, you better be rewarding that behavior. Even if she did something wrong and you are just furious, if you call her to come, you need to reward that behavior. Because if you call her to come to reprimand her, she will never want to come to you again. And even if I call her to come and she like comes halfway and then stops and is like, yeah, maybe not, all I'm gonna do is I'll say, Ruthie, no, and I'll kind of walk towards her. And usually at that point she'll like, oh, okay, and she'll come running back to me. And then I'll reward that behavior. Even if I had to walk up to her and I got like 10 feet away and then she turned and came to me, I would still reward that behavior. That way I am rewarding the action of coming. So if you have any questions about the recall, please let me know. That is the really big one. It's one that we've worked on a ton. Ruthie's great with it, but you do need to establish a, a relationship. Good girl, good girl. So now um, our hand signals. So the first one is sit which is just a scoop over the nose. I'm not making a big drastic motion, it's just holding my hand out. Then down, I'll take my hand flat, I'll take her down, and then stay as a stop sign. Ruthie, come here, right here. Sit, so it's just a scoop over her nose, down, stay. Hopefully she's in frame there. I'll do it again just in case not. Okay, good girl. So she has some great stays, uh, but don't be satisfied with them. Always strive to improve. Ruthie, sit. No, now we're guessing. Okay. Sit, down, stay. Okay, good girl. So she has both a sit and a down stay. So sit. Nope, oh, nope, stop guessing. She's really good at guessing what I want. So sometimes you just gotta get her focused. Stay. Now you'll notice there I put her in a sit stay, but she laid down. I'm fine with that. However, if I put her in a down stay, she's not allowed to come up. So when we work on these stays, we're working on what we call her the three D's, and that's distance duration, distraction. So by adding those three things, you're building a solid stay. Okay, good girl, good girl, good girl. Now, like I said, she has some phenomenal stays. She's great, uh, but don't be sad. So I always try to improve them. Now you'll also notice that 
um, I tell her it once and I'm done. I'm not going to sit there and go, sit, 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 sit. Um, and the reason is because she just needs time to process it sometime. And so if you do that, especially for stays, if you sit there and stay, 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 she's going to wait until you stop saying it or you put your hand down and then she's going to break because she's going to be so reliant upon the word. So say it once, allow her to think about it, and then be done. You'll notice though where she's getting super distracted and she's trying to guess what I want. I just get her attention back, make sure she's focused, and then gave her the hand signal again. I didn't have to ask for it over and over again. So the next two commands don't necessarily have strict hand signals. It's more having her rely on my body language. And an example, the first example would be crate. So I can tell her, Ruthie, come here, crate. I just need to stand near it and point. And once she turns around and goes in, I'll give her the treat. She's also expected to stay until released. Okay, good girl. Okay. Good girl, good girl. Great. So if she hesitates, uh, I can just talk, tap on the top. Okay, good girl. Now the crate command is one that you are, you are going to want to practice quite a bit, crate. Because if you only use it when you're going to lock her up, she's going to realize that and no longer want to go in. You'll also notice I can shut up and by opening it, okay. That is not a release. She needs to wait for that verbal release. Very similar, I can tell her, go to bed. I don't care what position she's in, as long as all four paws are on the bed, and then she is expected to stay there until released. Okay, good girl. Now, I'm allowing her to eat these treats off the floor. I'm kind of double treating her. In general, for both of these commands, I give her a treat when she goes on or in, not when she comes out, because being released is a reward in itself. But I'm setting her up for the next command. Ruthie, go to bed. You'll also notice when she does go on um, or in the crate, I don't use our release word. I can say good girl or something like that, but that release word is reserved for when she is finished and so when you're ready to let her out. Now, I'm going to show you her next command, which is leave it. I'm going to take a hold of the leash just so I do have some control because I'm going to make this hard for her. I'm going to drop a treat here on the ground. Okay, good girl. Okay, leave it. Good girl. So with leave it, she knows that this treat is permanently forbidden. Okay. No, leave it. So she goes for it like that. Nope. I'm just going to give her a little leash pressure. Yeah, trying to cheat on me now. Leave it. Good girl. Okay, good girl. Good girl. Come here, Ruthie. Good girl. So I'm just trying to walk her around in this area. I'm trying to just really improve this command. Always leave it. Good girl. Because uh, you're going to use this command if you're cooking, you drop something on the floor you don't want her to get, or you're on a walk and there's a dead possum there. Uh, you can tell her to leave it and expect her to understand that it's permanently forbidden. Otherwise, if you, like if I let her then eat this treat off the floor, what's going to stop her from being on a walk and you're going to find that dead animal and she's going to stop and look at you and just wait for you to release her so that she can go and eat it. And we don't want that. So that's why this is permanently forbidden. Instead, once I'm done, I'll just pick it up and it can just be thrown back in the bag. So. Um, and you can see, I mean, obviously that's a lot harder because I'm keeping her in the area versus if we're on a walk, uh, we're going to quickly get past that and it, she's going to be out of the area. Uh, now we're going to cover her crate training and her house training, uh, and then we're going to try and go for a walk. We're getting pounded with snow, so I don't know how much she's going to want to walk, but to start, 
So crate training. She is great in the crate. We have no issues. She's sleeping through the night. We put her to bed at 10, get her out at 6. Uh, she's not needing any breaks. She's not having accidents or being vocal. So she's great. Uh, she's also been good to be in the crate for four hours during the day. So four hour blocks um, without needing a break or without being vocal. Now, with that being said, so this transition period kind of disrupts everything and she's going to be under some stress. So it's not a bad idea the first night, maybe even the first two nights, just to set an alarm and give her a quick break. And when I say a break, put her on a leash, take her out to the bathroom, bring her back in. She doesn't need to run around and play or get water or anything like that. Just a quick bathroom break so that we don't get to the point of her needing to vocalize that she needs to go. <clears throat> now, if she has been in the crate longer than, say, an hour and she starts getting really vocal, I do think, okay, maybe she needs to go. But it's important that you never let her out when she is being vocal. So if she started that and I do think she needs to go to the bathroom, I'm still going to tell her no hush and I expect her to be quiet at least for you know 20, 30 seconds, then I'll get her out and take her to the bathroom. But she never gets out of the crate if she's being vocal. So it also might happen that the first time, maybe even the first two times you put her in the crate, because of that stress, she's gonna say, hey, you're my source of comfort, I don't wanna be in here, let me out, and she'll start barking a little bit. You have to ignore that. If you ignore it, that'll last maybe two minutes, and she'll quiet down, she'll be good to go, uh, but you never let her out. I can prepare for that though the first time I'm putting her in a crate I'll have a blanket ready that I can drape over it uh, or a bully stick that she can chew on just to help her calm down uh, But other than that she's not going to get any attention from me If she carried on longer than you know two to five minutes then I might go in and, and say hush So hush is that that word just to have her quiet down, but she has been really really great uh, inside the crate. So I don't imagine you'll have any issues with that. Oh, good girl. But if you do need to adjust that schedule, do it gradually. Because as of right now, at 6 a.m., uh, she that internal alarm is going to go off and say, hey, it's, it's time for food. So just to be aware there. Now, also understand that it is important that you crate her when you're home as well as when you're gone. If you only do it when you leave or at night, she's going to associate that. You can create separation anxiety. And so instead, we want her not to know whether you're leaving or whether you're staying. And that will help her just, she'll be comfortable and she'll be, uh, you won't have to deal with the vocal issues. Uh, so, good girl. Okay. Good girl. But she is, she's great. She's super sweet. So, But now the big one. So the house training. Now, as I get into this, that 100% supervision is the most important thing you're going to do. If you cannot give her 100% supervision, put her in a crate. She's more than comfortable in there. She has no issues spending a few hours, or even if it's 15 minutes. Now, we have had great success with the house training, but I will tell you that if you follow my instructions, you won't have any issues. But if you let slide and you don't follow those, issues can arise. Uh, I am here to help you, so if you do have any questions, please don't hesitate, let me know. But I'm gonna show you how to transition the bells. Uh, the concept is called free shaping. I'm basically allowing her to teach herself, and I'm just marking the behavior. Oh, good girl. So this is gonna be a little bit of an inconvenience for the next couple weeks, but once again, if you do it, you won't have any issues. So the first thing that we are going to do is called targeting the bell. So I am just going to hold this bell in front of her. I'm going to stare at it, and I will give her a treat every time she hits it. So nothing more. It's just I'm just basically a treat dispenser here for every time she touches the bell. It's all right if this takes a second uh, because I am going to allow her to process things and just find out on her own what gets a reaction. Okay, good girl.
Okay, good girl. Okay, good girl. So I'll let her ring this, you know, four or five times. If she can stay standing on the bed. Okay, good girl, good girl. One more time here. Oh, that wasn't here. Okay, good girl. Good girl. So once she's ringing them consistently off of my hand, then I'm going to go to the door, take her by the leash. Good girl. And I'm going to do the same thing, other than my wording is going to change a little bit. Okay, outside. Good girl. Okay, outside. Good girl. I'm going to emphasize the word outside. Okay, outside. Good girl. One more time here, and then I'm going to take her out. Okay, outside. Good girl. Okay. Okay, good girl. When we go outside, I give her maybe a, a minute or two to sniff around find a place to go. Periodically, I'll, I'll repeat the word outside. Uh, if she's sniffing, I'll give her a little extra time. If she comes over and just looks up at me, I know that she really doesn't have to go, so we'll just go back inside. <clears throat> now, if, uh, if she goes out there and she quickly pees, but you suspect that maybe she needs to go number two, just give her an extra minute or so. Now, if I were doing this at your home, even though we just went out, she did pee, I would immediately have her ring the bells again a few more times, go back outside. I'm going to do that like four or five times. Obviously, she's not going to need to go every time, but I want the quick repetitions of her ringing the bells and going out to the area where it's all right to go to the bathroom and then coming back in. So this is where it's kind of an inconvenience because we're going to go in and out, in and out, in and out. Now, if she doesn't go, it's just a neutral experience. I don't reward her, I don't correct her. We just come back in. Now for the first 24 hours, I am gonna set a timer and every 30 minutes, I am gonna walk her over, have her ring the bells, ring them two or three times, give her a treat. We're gonna go out, give her the opportunity to go to the bathroom and we come back in, reset the timer. The exception here is that she's in the crate because uh, obviously you don't need to get her out or if she's just passed out of sleep, I'm just gonna wait till she wakes up. Now, after that first 24 hours, so day two, for the next 24 hours, I'm going to go to the bells every 45 minutes. On day three, I'm going to do every hour. And when I hit day three, I'm going to stop giving her a treat when she rings the bells and only give her the treat or the reward when she pees. I'm also going to stay at an hour for probably three or four days just to make sure that her, her bowels and her system kind of gets back in order. Now, after that, the next week, you can progress to two hours. So two hours is our standard that every puppy can, uh, every puppy I send home should be able to hold their bladder, not have an accident, and be uh, reliable ringing the bells. Now, for the first month, I wouldn't pa push her past two hours, just because I don't want to give her the opportunity to have an accident. Also, don't be surprised in the first week or two if she doesn't go out and seek the bells on her own. And that's just because you're giving her so many opportunities to go. Uh, as long as you're consistent, she's understanding that you have the same expectations I do, and she's seeing that the bell means to go out to the bathroom. Now, every time she rings the bell, I take her on leash out to the bathroom, then we come back in. If she rings the bell, there is absolutely no playtime outside. So even if you had her and you were going to go outside and play fetch or something and she ran up and rang the bells, I would take her out to the bathroom, I would come back in, wait 20-30 seconds, and then go back outside. So every time she rings the bells, it's just to go to the bathroom. Uh, so that's that process. I said a little bit of an inconvenience, but if you'll, if you'll stick to the schedule and you'll keep that 100% supervision, you won't have any issues. But if you do have questions, please call me. Now. I would look for indicators that she may need to go to the bathroom. So one, if she's just waking up, she's been asleep for a while or in the crate for a while, she probably needs to go, so just take her, let her ring the bells, go outside. 
Uh, if she gets up and she starts sniffing really heavily, or panting, or pacing, all three of those are pretty good indicators she needs to pee. If she gets up and starts pivoting little circles, grab her, run her outside, skip the bells. Nobody likes what happens next. So Now, if she does have an accent, hopefully she won't, but you can expect a little regression from stress, but regression doesn't have to mean accidents as long as we just really stay on top of it and we really manage her, the house training. But if she does have an accident, if she snuck off and you discover it two minutes, an hour, 24 hours later, there's nothing you can do about it. She's not going to understand what you're correcting her for, so the only thing you can do is clean it up and slap yourself on the wrist. Now, if she is going to have an accent, I want it to be right in front of me. And that's the scariest I get. I stomp, I clap them, no, 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 and I just run her outside. The goal is to stop her midstream, and we get outside and allow her to finish. Once she finishes peeing outside, then I change my emotion around and I'm very praising. Oh, okay, good girl, good outside. And that way I'm creating <clears throat> a black and white experience. She just got corrected for going here, but rewarded for going here. So that way, you know, we can help her understand that once again, it's the you have the same rules that I do. So uh, also going along with this is going to be her routine. So making sure that she doesn't engorge herself on water is going to be important because they do have a tendency to do that during this transition. So I will give her water, like I'll give it to her with meals and then maybe three or four other times throughout the day for the first two weeks, uh, but I'm not going to give her unlimited access to water. And then I make sure that it is taken away by eight so that she has two hours to clear her system before going in the crate. And then as far as food goes, we feed her at 6.30 a.m. and 6 p.m. That way she has a good four hours to clear her system before she goes in the crate for bed. Um, I also, I've been giving her about a cup and a half each meal. If she doesn't finish it, if she gets up and walks away to do something other than get a drink, I'm going to take that food away and she doesn't get it back until uh, her next meal. Also, because she's going to be stressed out, it's not a bad idea to throw like some pumpkin uh, and some yogurt into her food just to help uh, help her stomach. So, once again, if you have any questions about any of that, please let me know. But now we're going to talk about our last part of the program, which is her leash work. So we take her on two different types of walks. The first being that long lead or off leash walk that we talked about. Uh, during that time, we're really focusing on her recall command, but that. That walk is really just for her to be a dog. Just let her run around and sniff and play, and it's just great for their mental health. Uh, during that time, just focus on that that recall command and, and have a good time. But until you know that she's going to come back to you every time, I would not let her off leash. Now, the second type of walk is our attention walk. Uh, when we do that, we have two commands. The first one is let's go, just signifying that we're going to start walking. I'll also tell her that when we make corners. And then the second is easy, and that's if she starts to pull. I will accompany that with those two pops. <clears throat> now, when we are on a walk, when I stop, I expect her to stop and sit down. Now, I am going to go outside and try and demonstrate this for you. It is super wet and snowy, so I'm not going to make her sit down um, on the road. But when it's dry, I do enforce that. Before we go out there, though, I want to emphasize one part of, of the leash work, or the walk. <clears throat> Walking is the one time that you can guarantee something is going to happen that's going to cause your dog to react. Whether that's um, <laughs> a jogger, another walker, a dog, a squirrel, whatever it is, there's going to be something that's going to cause your dog to react. So if she doesn't have trust in you as the leader, she's going to become overreactive. That's when a dog really wants to pull or they want to bark or they get fearful. And so to have a really good walk, you need to build a solid relationship with her. And so as you start this, I would honestly start by walking like two houses down and then turn around and come back two houses. And so it's just really quick and I want to do this at a time where there's the least amount of distractions. So I can just focus on me and her and getting some positive repetitions and building some trust. And so when I do that, I'm going to have her by my side. I always have her on the left side, but I'm going to walk 
And if she's looking at me, as soon as we make eye contact, I'm going to tell her, okay, good girl. Okay, good girl. And I'll sit there and reward her every time she looks at me. So I'm just building trust in this. Now, if you approach something, or there's a jogger running towards you, and all of a sudden she gets excited, I'll stop. If she starts to pull, I'll pop her twice, tell her easy, and expect her to come and sit down and put that slack back in the leash. If she's really focused on that jogger, I might say, Ruthie, come here. And I'll kind of walk backwards, get her to sit down in front of me, or I might even put my back towards the distraction and have her sit down, and then I'll just engage with her. I'll just, okay, good girl, okay, good girl. So that way, when those distractions happen, uh, you're going to be this source of, one, protection, but also this exciting source of food, and it's just, uh, she's going to learn that as soon as she sees a distraction, she's going to focus on you because something good's going to happen. Now, if she really wanted to pull, she's just trying to get towards uh, the jogger or the other dog, and you tell her easy and she doesn't respond, at that point, I am going to start doing an exercise, which people will look at you funny, but if you do it, you're going to teach your dog that she cannot progress towards any distraction unless she's focused. So she's sitting there pulling, I tell her easy, she doesn't respond, I'm just going to pop her again a little more firm, <clears throat> do a 180, say let's go and walk the opposite direction. And at this point, I'm walking with a really quick pace. As soon as she starts to stare at me, I'll say, okay, good girl, I'll turn around and walk back towards the distraction. And if you start walking back and she starts pulling again, this time I'm not going to say anything, I'm just going to pop her and turn around and walk back. And then I'm going to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth really fast not giving her any indicator of when I'm going to turn around. So that way she is going to get popped a little bit, but she's going to learn that if she watches you, she's not going to get yanked around. So hopefully that makes sense. Usually I demonstrate that out on the road, but like I said, with it being so snowy, I'm not sure how this walk is going to be because I'm not sure she's really going to want to walk in it. But we are going to go outside and show you that. Generally, when I start this type of walk, I ask them to sit, which she did, uh, but I wasn't going to force her to do it where we're walking basically in slush. But I do expect her to be by my side, loose leash, periodically looking up at me. Let's go. You'll notice I have this leash really short and uh, that way she's only allowed to maybe get a step in front of me. I'll give her just a little tap. I expect her to be watching me and not pulling. And then I'll give her a treat every so often when she's really focused on me. Let's go. 